Thank you everyone for joining and welcome. I'm Kevin Bokach, Senior Communications Officer for the HIV Prevention Trials Network. A reminder to everyone on the call to please stay muted while our speakers are delivering their remarks and to please submit questions via the chat function in Zoom and remember to type your name and affiliation. Before getting started, our panelists are here today to talk about the results from the HPTN084 study. We ask you to please keep your questions focused around the study results, HIV prevention, for the Cavitegravir program. Thank you. I'd like to now turn things over to the principal investigator of the HPTN and director of the Institute for Global Health at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Dr. Myron Cohen. Thanks, Kevin. Thank, thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, as you all know, the acquisition of HIV worldwide remains a, a major threat and young, when young women are particular risk uh, for infection. This morning, you will hear the results of a large multinational trial, HBTN 084, designed to determine if a long-acting antiviral uh, drug, antiretroviral drug, uh, cabotegravir nanosuspension, can be used as prophylaxis to protect women from HIV infection. The study represents uh, the work of many teams of investigators and thousands of volunteers. The HBTN 084 study was sponsored by the NIH with the collaboration of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and two pharmaceutical companies, Vive and Gilead. This morning, you will first hear from Dr. Sinead delaney Moretway and Mina Hassinapur, the co-principal investigators of the HPTN 084 study. Their presentations will be followed by comments from, uh, by doc, from Dr. Anthony Fauci, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, and Dr. and Ms. Deborah Waterhouse, the chief executive officer of V Pharmaceuticals. Uh, we will, as Kevin indicated, address all questions through the chat box. Thank you so much for joining us. And now I want to turn the podium over to Dr. Uh, Delaney Moreltway. Mer 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 Thank you, Dr. Cohen, and good morning to all of you. I have important information to share about the HPTN 084 study. I'll first review the design of HPTN 084. The HIV Prevention Trials Network, or HPTN 084, is a phase three multicenter randomized double blind controlled trial that was designed to evaluate the efficacy and safety of long acting injectable cabotegravir to prevent the sexual acquisition of HIV in cisgender women at risk for HIV infection. The study compares the effectiveness of cabotegravir to daily oral Truvada. Truvada has been shown to be highly effective for HIV prevention when taken as prescribed in a variety of populations and contexts. In HPTN 084, study participants were randomized in a one-to-one -one ratio to one of two study arms. One arm received active cabotegravir and a Truvada placebo. The other arm received active Truvada and placebos for cabotegravir. Cabotegravir was administered daily by mouth for five weeks and then via intramuscular injection at eight weekly intervals after an initial four week interval load. Participants in both arms were offered open label daily oral Truvada for 48 weeks after their last injection. I will now review the study population involved, enrolled. A total of 3,224 HIV uninfected participants were enrolled between November the 27th, 2017 and November the 6th, 2020 at 20 sites in seven countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, including Botswana, Eswatini, Kenya, Malawi, South Africa, Uganda, and Zimbabwe. A total of 3,127 participants were included in the analysis at the time of the DSMB review. The mean age of study participants was 26 years, and 57% of participants were 25 years or younger. 82% of women enrolled were not living with their sexual partner. 55% reported two or more partners in the past month, with 34% having a primary partner who is reported to be living with HIV or of unknown HIV status. Recognizing the challenges of COVID-19, the HPTN 084 study team developed plans responding to the impact of the pandemic on study conduct. The plans included significant measures to protect study participants and site staff during COVID-19. The team also proactively established metrics of disruption and used these to assess whether an administrative censoring of data would be needed during potential periods of disruption. I'm pleased to tell you that at no time during the implementation of the study did we meet the pre-specified disruption threshold for censoring of data. As of November the 6th, 2020, participant visit completion at months 6, 12, 
18 and 24 was 94%, 91%, 89% and 91% of expected. I will now tell you more about the NIH multi multinational DSMB review. I am pleased to inform you that the blinded study reached its objective and the DSMB recommended stopping of the current blinded portion of the study after its review on November the 5th, 2020. The DSMB considered the analysis of the preliminary findings of 38 incident cases of HIV infection. These 38 infections are included in the intent to treat analysis and are all infections deemed to have occurred after enrollment and are included regardless of whether participants continue to take their assigned study drug. The overall HIV incidence amongst all participants was 1%, suggesting that both cabotegravir and Truvada are highly effective for HIV prevention in this population. 34 incident infections were detected in participants assigned to the Truvada arm, uh, equivalent to an incidence of 1.79%, and four incident infections were detected in the participants assigned to the cabotegravir arm, equivalent to an incidence of 0.21%. That is, we observed roughly nine times the number of incident infections in the Truvada arm compared to the cabotegravir arm. The hazard ratio in the cabotegravir versus Truvada arms was 0.11 with a confidence interval of 0.04 to 0.32. The interpretation of this finding is that cabotegravir is superior to Truvada in preventing HIV infection in cisgender women and the threshold for early stopping of the trial was crossed. Based on these efficacy findings, the independent DSMB recommended that the blinded portion of the study be stopped early and results released to the scientific and broader stakeholder communities. In addition, in a random sample of approximately 362 participants receiving Truvada, plasma tenofovir concentrations were measured. 64% of plasma samples contained detectable concentrations of tenofovir. 48% of specimens had concentrations of tenofovir consistent with daily use. This suggests that the HPTN-084 study population was more adherent to daily oral Truvada than had originally been anticipated, likely conferring even higher levels of protection against HIV infection for Truvada recipients than had been assumed in the original study design. Concentrations of tenofovir in plasma and tenofovir diphosphate in red blood cells for all those who acquired HIV infection after being assigned to Truvada are currently being evaluated. In addition, concentrations of cabotegravir in, the plas in plasma for a subset of participants and for all those who acquired HIV infection after being assigned to cabotegravir are also being tested. An analysis of the timing of incident infections in participants who received cabotegravir relative to their last known clinic provided injection are also underway. And resistance testing for incident HIV infections is in progress. I will now hand over to my co-chair, Dr. Mina Husanipour, who will share the rest of the safety results with you. Thank you very much. From a safety perspective, both cabotegravir and Truvada were safe and well tolerated in HPTN084. Most adverse events were mild or moderate and were well balanced between the arms. GI symptoms and nausea were slightly more common in the Truvada arm. Injection site reactions were more commonly observed among participants in the cabotegravir arm than in the Truvada arm. Injection site reactions were reported by 9% of participants in the Truvada arm and 32% of participants in the cabotegravir arm. Injection site reactions were most commonly mild to moderate pain and or tenderness and mostly experienced at the first injection. Zero participants in either arm discontinued injections due to injection related adverse events. I am now going to review the immediate next steps for the HPTN 084 protocol. All of the institutional review boards and ethics committees overseeing the study, site investigators and the study participants are being notified of these results as soon as possible. Participants will also be informed of the medication they received in the study. A protocol amendment will be submitted for regulatory review 
to allow participants to continue taking their assigned medication or to switch to cabotegravir long acting if they choose to. Participants on Truvada will be offered open label cabotegravir as soon as the medication can be made available. The oral lead in will be optional for participants who choose to switch from Truvada to cabotegravir. All participants currently on the study will continue to be followed on study. Participants choosing not to remain in the study will be referred to the best locally available HIV prevention services. We are in the process of making these results available to national drug regulatory authorities. We look forward to presenting these results in peer reviewed settings at upcoming conferences and in manuscript form as we continue to finalize the primary analysis and begin work on multiple important secondary analyses. I'm now going to provide some information on other studies involving cabotegravir. Earlier this year, a sibling study in cisgender men and transgender women, HPTN 083, showed that a PrEP regimen containing long-acting cabotegravir injected once every eight weeks was superior to daily oral Truvada for HIV prevention, very similar to our findings. Open label adolescent bridging studies, uh, studies entitled 083-01 and 084-01 are poised to provide critical safety and acceptability data in adolescents and young adults in support of regulatory approvals for youth. The sub-studies in HPTN 084, including a contraceptive sub-study, a qualitative sub-study, and a sub-study of women who become pregnant during the trial will continue as planned. And I'll hand back over to Sinead. Thank you, Mina. In conclusion, we'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate all the participants their communities, the community advisory boards, investigators and site staff on this tremendously exciting result. This great success is a shared success for all of us and one we hope will lead to the expansion of HIV prevention options for at-risk cisgender women globally and ultimately reductions or elimination of HIV acquisition. We recognize that we are here because of a tremendous collaboration of many stakeholders. On behalf of my co-chair, Dr. Husanipur, we appreciate the support of our colleagues at FHI 360, the Statistics and Data Management Center, the Laboratory Center, the HPTN Network and Network Leadership, and particularly the HPTN 083 team, as well as our in-country partners. We wish to acknowledge the study sponsor, the Division of AIDS at the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Disease, as well as the funding partnership of NIAID, the National Institutes for Mental Health, Vive, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as the generous contribution of study drug by Gilead colleagues. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Sinead. We'll now uh, have the privilege of asking Dr. Anthony Fauci, who I can see, for his comments. Uh, Tony. Yeah, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to make a, a few brief comments. And, and obviously, and first of all, to congratulate everyone who worked so hard, the HPTN team themselves, the extraordinary collaboration that we had with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as the pharmaceutical companies, Vive and Gilead. Uh, as we all know, uh, and I mean, every one of us has been impacted right now by the extraordinary historic COVID-19 pandemic that has gripped all of us globally. But in the middle of all of that, which is having an extraordinary impact, we cannot and should not forget the extraordinary impact of HIV consistently and persistently on the globe with now more than 1.6 million infections each year. The last 2019 count had 1.6, 1.7 million infections dominated in many areas of the world, particularly in Southern Africa, by infections in young women. I don't think we can overemphasize the importance of this study that we we're just discussing this morning. One of the stumbling blocks in our prevention modalities has been the inconsistency or lack of efficacy of pre-exposure prophylaxis in those who need it the most, namely young women, particularly those 
in Southern Africa. The idea that you can have an injectable that at this point now, given every couple of months, but may even get better as we go on, that is as good as if not better than oral Travada. I think for those who are not involved in HIV, we need to let them know that this is a major, major advance in the prevention modality. So I wanna congratulate everybody for the extraordinarily hard work on a very, very important problem. Thank you. Thank, thanks so much, Tony. Now we'd like to hear from uh, Deborah Waterhouse, the Chief Executive Officer of V Pharmaceuticals. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to make a few remarks. I'll be brief to ensure that we have um, plenty of time for questions. Leave Healthcare is a pharmaceutical company that's 100% dedicated to the development of new and innovative medicines to prevent, treat, and hopefully one day cure HIV. We have a mission to leave no person living with HIV behind. Uh, and that means ensuring um, access to our medicines for all those living with HIV, irrespective uh, of where in the world they live and their ability to pay. And we're proud of the fact that as we speak, more than 8 million people worldwide living with HIV are taking a Dolotegravir-based regimen. Um, and this is actually mostly through generic partners where we have waived our intellectual property to ensure that access to this medicine uh, is, is there. Today's a story of the empowerment of girls and women. When we look to the continent of Africa, until today, it's been a sad reality that the epidemic has continued to impact women and adolescent girls uh, the most. And we believe today's news marks the beginning of a shift uh, in that paradigm. The 083 and 084 studies demonstrate above all the power of partnerships. And I would particularly like to call out our relationship with the NIH, HPTN and the Gates Foundation these are long running and very special partnerships. For more than seven years, we focused on working with a well-established network that has the ability to recruit from diverse populations. The 083 study was the largest ever conducted in black men who have sex with men and transgender women, and also people under 30 years of old, uh, 30 years of age. The 084 study with more than 3000 women in sub-Saharan Africa is the first ever study of long acting injectable therapies for HIV prevention amongst women. We've always been committed to diversity in clinical trials and instead of focusing on how difficult it is, we've chosen the right partners. And as a result, we've all together found a way to make it happen. Women need more choices for HIV prevention, particularly in parts of the world where they are disproportionately impacted by HIV. They need discrete options that empower them to protect themselves without negotiating with their sexual partners and with such clear findings of superiority in the most vulnerable populations who would benefit from PrEP, this new option for HIV prevention may help us to shift the arc of the epidemic. So thank you very much for allowing me to speak today and I'll hand back to Mike. Thank, thanks Deborah so much and Tony. Um, there are several questions. Let me, let me start out though with one that I think is fundamental. Kimberly Smith, the head of research and development is on this call and the question is, it, what are the regulatory plans for this agent? Uh, while uh, these trials are compelling, uh, how do the agents get into the hands of the, uh, the users and what are, what are the plans, Kimberly, uh, for going forward? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike, for the question. And thank you to uh, those on the call who've raised the question. We're extremely excited about the data. And obviously, this goes uh, along with the data that we saw from 083 and demonstrating superiority of cavitegavir over oral PrEP. And so our intention is to file um, beginning in the first half of 2020. We'll begin with a file to the FDA and move on to other regulatory agencies around the world. And it is our intention that we will include data from both 083 and 084. And so that the indication for uh, cavitegavir for PrEP would include really all populations, uh, men uh, and, and women, uh, both trans and cisgender. So we have a really ambition to uh, make this drug very widely uh, available to those who are vulnerable and may benefit from it. And what is the time frame? One of the other questions, Kimberly, can you start guessing the time frame when regulators, either US regulators or other regulators, will, will allow us to make this available? 
So um, that is still a bit up in the air, but I can tell you the best estimate. So if we are able to get the submission done within the first half of 2021, uh, the review period for the FDA typically would be 10 months. However, if it is given a priority review, it could be reduced to six months. And so if that's the case, we could see an approval as early as the end of uh, 2021, and then we would in be intent to make uh, the product available uh, beginning in early uh, 2022. Now that's just starting with the FDA. Other regulatory agencies would typically follow mm -hmm. and their timelines uh, are, tend to be a bit longer, but this is you know, still, uh, still in the works. A question for Sinead is clarifying the use of Truvada among those in the cabotegravir arm. I, I think that you'll have to clarify a little bit more the discrete uh, distance or difference between the two groups, Sinead. Yes, thanks very much for that question. So um, in this trial, we hypothesized that cabotegravir would be superior to Truvada because of the adherence advantage that an eight weekly injection gives over daily pills. So all participants were, uh, but this trial was a double blind, double dummy, which means that all participants received either the active cabotegravir plus a placebo Truvada or active Truvada and um, placebo cabotegravir. So during the injection phase, they would have received injections and pills, uh, but comparing cabotegravir to Truvada. And what our results show is that cabotegravir was indeed superior to Truvada in preventing HIV infection and prevented nine times as many infections uh, as those in the Truvada arm. But overall, we're incredibly impressed at the low incidence of HIV in this trial overall, reflecting that both agents are highly effective in preventing HIV in women. Now, uh, being respectful as, as people gather more questions, Tony, I don't know how comfortable you are. There's a lot of questions of people wanting you to, since you mentioned COVID versus HIV, a lot of people want your opinion of uh, news related to COVID today. Um, I don't know if you're comfortable on this particular sure. question that's getting into that. Yeah, I don't want to take away from the, from the importance of, of what we're talking about with HPTN 084, I can only say it's a really good day for biomedical research and clinical application of biomedical research. So you have two major dominating pandemics in the world, HIV and COVID, and you have an extraordinary advance now with HPTN 084. What happened with the Pfizer study very briefly is that the uh, Data and Safety Monitoring Board looked at the first analysis of 94 individuals in a trial that was geared to looking at 164 events. Uh, and the data were absolutely striking. The efficacy of the Pfizer mRNA candidate is over 90%, which is just extraordinary and is gonna have a major impact on everything that we do with regard to COVID. The reason it's important in and of itself, it's an important uh, advance, I mean, extraordinary. Uh, it validates the mRNA platform. Uh, it validates greatly the spike protein as the target of the anti-coronavirus uh, response that clearly is protective. And the reason this is important is that virtually every one of the other vaccines, Moderna is an mRNA candidate, which we would expect would have similar results but the other candidates, the other platforms all use the spike protein as the target of the immune response. So we have the first out of the gate with Pfizer with uh, something that not very many people expected it would be as high as that, a 90% efficacy just is extraordinary. So right now we wanna take a look at the details of the data, but this is very good news looking forward. So it's a good day for biomedical research, Mike. Uh, Tony, let me, let me ask you to clarify something that I think that is a little bit confused in the news media. Since they're looking at 94 events, right. uh, that is people who acquired COVID, right. we're not really talking about preventive infection. We're no. talking about biological differences in pro progression of disease. Is well, we're talking about clinically manifested disease. The primary endpoint is clinically recognizable disease. The secondary endpoints are advanced disease and infection. But the primary endpoint that guided the decision on this is clinically recognizable disease. 
Thanks. Um, other questions? Uh, so I think we've, we've uh, taken the liberty of um, addressing those questions. Other questions for any of the panelists um, related to uh, as, uh, focusing on uh, cabotegravir? Um, let's give it a minute or two. Congratulations to the study team and, and for the generosity of all the investigators. Uh, uh, generous Mike, level. I'm happy to answer the question regarding um, the availability of cabotegavir now that has come from a couple of the uh, participants. Please, please proceed. So um, we are developing, Vive Healthcare is developing cabotegavir in combination with ropivirine uh, from Janssen Pharmaceuticals as a therapeutic. And it has been approved for uh, use as an HIV therapeutic in in Canada, it is under review uh, in the United States by the FDA and the FDUFA date is um, January 28th of 2021. It has also uh, been reviewed by the European uh, agency and has uh, re received a positive CHMP opinion when we anticipate uh, likely approval uh, in Europe by the end of this year. And so the current availability is again approved in Canada and uh, limited availability as in, in an expanded access, compassionate use uh, capacity. Thank Thanks. you for the question. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, Sinead, I don't know if you're comfortable addressing this because I think you do know a little bit more. One of uh, the audience have asked about what you know about the four individuals. Um, are, are you comfortable saying anything more about the, the four in the cabotegravir arm that acquired uh, COVID? Yeah. So. Again, thanks for that question. I think these four people are going to be uh, really important to our understanding of um, how cabotegravir works to prevent infection. We're currently doing additional testing of um, samples to uh, understand uh, drug concentrations, which will obviously tell us a little bit more about drug concentrations relative to infection and also understanding uh, HIV resistance profiles. What I can tell you is out of the four infections, at least two occurred in people who did not initiate injections at all. So two out of four participants uh, had uh, developed uh, HIV infection while they were receiving uh, injections, but the other two never advanced to receiving injections. And that is part of the, as we call it, the intent to treat analysis. They were included in the analysis, irrespective of whether or not they actually completed uh, their injection series. And we will certainly be able to share further results once all of that testing is has been completed. Um, while, while we wait to see if there are more questions, I know my colleague, Dr. El Sader, who's the co-PI of the network, would like to comment. So, uh, Wath, if you unmute yourself. Yes, um, and thank you, everyone, for being with us today. Of course, this is a, a critical milestone in HIV prevention and something that uh, we have all uh, been hoping for for many, many years and decades. And uh, just want to acknowledge, as um, Mike and Tony did, the, the multitude of individuals who've been involved in the conduct of the study. And uh, particularly, I think most importantly, the people on the ground, the investigators, as well as the staff at the, uh, at the facilities, at the research si sites that uh, were able to so successfully enroll and follow these uh, participants during the most difficult time. Uh, during the height of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So I think we need to acknowledge uh, their efforts and their commitment uh, to advancing the science of HIV prevention. Thanks, Thank Mike. You. Thank you so much, Rob. So I think um, having given people plenty of chance to ask questions, I just reiterate that for those of us who are working in HIV prevention, we see this as a, a truly remarkable um, set of observations related to long acting cabotegravir. I would emphasize that we're looking at the results of a clinical trial, but I would also thank all the investigators, preclinical investigators who worked on this drug for many years, then tested in animals, and reiterate what Wafa just said about the great generosity of the study subjects for their time and, and, and provide, allowing us to access their health care, and the investigators who remain so committed to this in the middle of a COVID pandemic, which is, you know, that was just an un unexpected. Uh, <laughs> unbelievable event. So I want to congratulate um, Vive for the success of their product and thank Tony Fauci and the NIH for sponsoring this study, uh, which was uh, a pretty heavy lift. 
and thank all at the press conference for participating um, and wish you all a really good day. So thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you.